Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Geopolitics with Tiberius D. Of course, I'm Tiberius D, and we're going to be talking about a new series, which we're actually going to be rebooting an old one. We'll be talking about the country spotlight of the United States, and I'll explain the details after the intro. Roll it. <laughs> everyone it's good to be back and it's good to be rebooting this series so for anyone who doesn't know or is not m majorly familiar you're, you're just coming into uh, this particular content is that uh, when I started back in December is that we had like everything for each country spotlight thrown in together so we'd have a geopolitical history we'd talk a little bit about what's going on and it evolved and changed over time but it wasn't quite what I liked and what I wanted but it was enough to get by just to get myself out there let people know what I'm talking about that kind of thing so now we're going to split this into two, we're going to be rebooting it, and we're going to have the country spotlight, which is largely just, hey, what's going on in this particular country? Today we'll be doing the United States, and then the next episode that will usually follow with it will be the, geopoli ge excuse me, the geopolitical history of that country, how it got from wherever it started or whatever it did start as to where it is today. And so we'll be hitting these tit for tat and going down the line. And, uh, of course, we'll largely be rebooting the nations that we already have. We'll be adding a few more. I know a lot of people were upset with me that I didn't do Brazil, and I didn't do Argentina. We will get there. We will definitely be getting there. They're on the list. But uh, I kind of wanted to get version 2.0 up and running because, uh, well, the perfection in, perfectionist in me was just killing me. So, without further ado... Today we're going to talk about the United States and the country spotlight. We're going to be doing the geography, demography, economics, political situation in the military. Just snapshot. What are we looking at? Where is this country at? And what's going on? All right. So without further ado, today we're going to. Or I'm sorry. Excuse me. We're going to start off with the geography section. We're going to be talking about how the geography and the climate relatively works for these nations. And we'll start with visual aids. And by the way, if you ha or you are watching this, this this form will not be on the podcast because you are, there's going to be a lot of visual aids. There's going to be a lot to be able to be seen there. And it, sometimes I'll be able to go off it on my head, but more often than not, a lot of the things I want to show you, the viewer, and that means it's going to be on the Twitch and it's going to be on the YouTube, but it will not be on the podcast. And so the history definitely will be, but this, not so much. All right, without further ado, let's kick up the display here. Oh, wrong display there. Uh, the climate is relatively good it's not amazing but uh there's some there's some key instances that that we want to get into now if you can't read this map that's okay what this map largely shows is that the united states is in some level of temperate zone or trubs or subtropical zone within the eastern part of the united states so it's you know relatively warm and temperate but it's not so hot that it will melt you of course, uh, if you get down there into Miami-Dade, you actually get into straight-up tropical reasons, and that's not fun. When you get off to the west, particularly once you get to the point of not necessarily Denver, but you're getting out there, is that it starts getting a lot more arid, and the weather becomes a lot more of a nightmare. Um, if you get into the Pacific Coast, it gets quite a bit better around San Francisco Bay, uh, the Oregon Valley, and the, sea, or, um, excuse me, the Washington Valley, but outside of that... The interior of the country, bordering the Rocky Mountains, is largely arid because it scrubs the air clean. It's not necessarily amazingly great, but you have an area here that is incredibly useful and beneficial through its geopolitical means as far as climate. So, uh, let me roll this back here for a second. The reason why this is important is, is that most nations only have one or two climate zones it's because they're just to give an example france is the size of texas germany isn't much bigger when we're used to dealing with like the former paleo powers or only a few of the other rivals is that geopolitically they're just significantly smaller and this is one of the major geopolitical advantages the united states has just within the lower 48 itself it has a continent to itself you know, if the imperial powers of Europe are the size of Texas, the United States is Texas plus seven. And so, 
Um, in a general level, this is actually very rewarding because it, 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 excuse me, it has access to major geopolitical resources and that it has oil in some areas. It has steel in some areas. It had aluminum, but unfortunately they pretty much mined it all. Um, it has most of the things that you need to be to maintain superpower status or at least a major geopolitical entity within its own borders, and so it doesn't have to reach out and touch face. Now, we can get into the geopolitical history of the oil wars and whatever, uh, definitely in the next episode, but in a, large, in a large proportion, the United States has largely been able to be self-sufficient, uh, largely since the era of Manifest Destiny. So, not going to get too much into the history here, but overall... Uh, the climate zones, it has some bad zones. I'm not going to say that it's, it's all perfect, but the majority or the majority of its climate is relatively solid and it's, it's some good stuff. You can largely grow stuff, not all year round, but you can grow stuff in a, a prolonged growing season. You have, um, access to large river networks such as the Mississippi river basin, which has of course the Ohio, the Arkansas river, the Missouri river, uh, the Red River, all of these rivers interconnect to a point where you can build up this massive logistical infrastructure that is very cheap to maintain and very easy to operate on, basically since the invention of steam power and steam locomotion. And that's not talking about the railroads nearly as much as it's talking about steamboats and paddle wheels. Uh, barges are just amazing. And uh, if the United States actually revokes something called the Jones Act, you can put ocean-going vessels into the Mississippi River itself, and that would be quite interesting. Uh, that will absolutely change the dynamics of how much the Americans deal with locomotion costs within the United States um, because barges are now getting to the point where they're close to trains and that shouldn't be the case at all. Um, and that just goes to show you that that's pr largely a regulatory body issue that is being in, in the way. You can put ocean-going vessels uh, that get all the way up to St. Louis in some cases and they're not doing that and that's becoming a problem for the Americans as far as logistics costs. But anyway, uh, we're going to also talk a little bit about uh, this particular map of mine, which a lot of people don't get a chance to look at or talk about. But without further ado, this is the ease of economic development. We're just going to be talking about the United States. And this is, uh, to a large degree... Um, Sly, thank you for the follow and welcome. Uh, this, to a large degree, is what we're dealing with here in the regards of... Some of these states are in the perfect zone of economic development. They have... Uh, warm winter, or I'm sorry, they have warm summers, they have re relatively mild winters, so you can kill all the bugs off, you can grow a lot of stuff, they've got really good access to resources, whether it's coal or natural gas, petroleum, what have you. Um, the the I belt, the Iowa, Illinois, Indiana belt, and you can throw Ohio into this, is absolutely uh, fantastic if you want to live there. I'm not getting into the politics, that's your own personal bag. What I'm getting at here is that these states are largely in the perfect geopolitical area that if you want to build out a functional civilization, this is in the area. And you'll notice that it's actually the Midwest that is largely this area um, personified. This is where you get the, be the most economic activity and ease of manufacturing and uh, construction. And the reason why is that while we have the Northeast Corridor and while we have California, which somebody just asked about, I will talk about that, is that... The Midwest, if you actually look at where the industrial plant was ever built in the United States, it was never, it was seldomly ever built, particularly after or after the Civil War in the West or the East, it was built in the interior of the country because it could access the geopolitical influence that is the Mississippi River Basin as far as transportation and the resources within the Midwest so that you could build out one of the biggest industrial plants that the world had ever seen. Um, now, granted, of course, there is that in the, uh, the eastern part uh, of the country, uh, excuse me here, I am losing my mind. Uh, of course, there's quite uh, quite other parts that you can find in the eastern and the western parts of the country where you'll have major facilities in like New York and Pennsylvania, we'll get into Wilmington and whatever. Um, but if you actually look at where most of the development has been in the country, it's been in the interior of the country. That is the heart and soul. And some people like to refer to the Midwest as the beating heart of the country. It actually is. That's where most of the food's grown. That's where most of the mining is actually done. Uh, now, some of that's actually changed in more recent years. But throughout most of the history of the United States, if you want to start somewhere, you start in the Midwest, and then you go out. You don't start east or west. So, 
To answer the question, question that was in chat that is relative, why is California yellow on that map? And the reason why California is yellow on that map is because of the Sierra Nevada and the Mojave Desert. Ease of economic development means two things. One, you have relatively stable climate, and if you're talking about the Bay Area, the, the climate's actually really wonderful, and it has one of the most stable climates, if not the most stable climate, in the United States. The problem is, is that the other side of that is the, or the economic and traditional barriers, or excuse me, geographical barriers in California are absolutely horrible. Getting up and down I-80 is a fucking nightmare, and even I-5, which straddles... Uh, the, the more flat parts of California and the western coast is has significant changes in elevation and dealing with um, locomotion. And so if you, want, if you want, definitely check out our city spotlights where we've talked about Los Angeles. We'll be talking about San Francisco soon. But in the whole general level here is that California has a serious problem. If you're in the Bay Area or if you're in the Greater Valley area, it's all integrated into one economic network. But getting out of that area is an absolute pain in the ass. And so California is actually yellow in that regard because if you're in the Mojave Desert, you're dying of thirst. Uh, and you can, you know, you can access the wider world, but you have to go through a fucking desert. Uh, if you're talking about uh, California itself, Long Valley is pretty solid, but you can't get out without getting on a boat and going somewhere else unless you want to get up, you know... 10% grades or 6% grades on the interstate or what have you. Uh, interesting name there, uh, as far as the follower there. All right. Um, the Midwest is largely not that case. Now, we can get into certain zones here a little bit if you guys have questions. The Midwest is relatively flat, has a lot of agricultural production, has a lot of in, er, uh, basically commodities that you can turn into industrial development, and you can build out a modern economic infrastructure with. Um, there's also the issue of over-legomation. That is in the politics, which I'm not really going to talk about the individual state politics, but overall, uh, each state has its particular political window that it operates within, and you can criticize that all day. I'm not literally going to go 50, each 50 states and hit every one of them and tell, say why they're good or bad. Uh, so we'll table that part. But at least for where I'm at right now, is that if you get into some of these states, they're really good, and I'm sure some people looked at that map and went, oh, why is Texas yellow? Eastern Texas, really, really good. Western Texas, really crap. Um, and you, you'll find that through most. The southern states are in green instead of blue because you're actually getting into a subtropical zone and it's hot as crap. And we'll actually redress this real quick for you guys. Is that if we're, you know, Just to show you again, is that Midwestern states, perfect climate zone, relatively flat, easy locomotion, easy, easy to build out an industrial plant. Hello. Um... When you're looking at the southern states, the only problem with the southern states writ large is that outside of like Virginia, North Carolina, that gets pretty mountainous, and also Tennessee, is that it's in a climate zone that's actually significantly hotter. It is, um, I mean, you, you guys can be using your AC in March just to shoot, like paint a picture here. So, yeah, absolutely getting into some hot levels of nonsense, but you guys largely are able to build out in the industrial plant the same way that the Midwest is. You have plenty of natural resources, plenty of things going on for you that is very beneficial to you. It's just a little hotter than what it is in the Midwest, and that will hurt you in the end because you don't have the natural pest control. And if you guys uh, think I'm crazy here, look at how much pesticides you put into just handling your cotton product. That is absolutely insane. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, West Coast, uh, largely, if you're on the coast itself, you're in some temperate climates or Mediterranean-like climates that are really nice, but you have horrible elevations and horrible geography all around you that keeps you hemmed in. That's why, instead of being green or blue, you guys are yellow, because you've got plenty going on for you, but you can't really reach out and touch the rest of the environment. Uh, obviously, you've got the Rocky Mountain states, which are just mountains and high-altitude deserts. Those aren't really fun to be in. Um, and then you get off to the Northeast Corridor. Uh, the only problem with the Northeast Corridor writ large is that it's largely, mount uh, not mountainous, but it's largely very hilly. This is the Appalachian Trail and the Appalachian Mountains. You can develop things in here. And actually, I might want to downgrade um, West Virginia to orange looking at this. But the, the general trend here is this. If you're on the coast, you're good. But most of the eastern states are literally, as soon as you get off the coast, you're up into mountainous or semi-mountainous territory. That uh, makes transportation and locomotion really hard. The good news is you have a massive seaboard that you can largely just float everything around on. And so you can interact with the Midwest, not by actually going through the continent, but it's actually easier and cheaper to go around, down around Florida, and then go up through the Mississippi River Basin to 
uh, get your geopolitical, uh, I'm sorry, to get your economic structures uh, filled out, and also your geopolitical ones, too. So, it's great to be part of the Great Union. Uh, I like to shit on it from time to time, but in a sense, the reason why the United States is so powerful is because it has a diverse geography that rewards it with numerous resources, but isn't so much that it's absolutely painful where you're sitting there in the middle of Saudi Arabia, as example, and yeah, you've got plenty of oil, but it's in a, it's in a desert and the entire area surrounding it is a desert. Uh, it has a nice balance where even if you're in some areas such as the western states that has like uranium that you need it isn't a complete pain to get to um, and so i'm largely going to end off on the geography section and say the united states is pretty well geared to go ge geopolitically and geographically because its climate's good its geography is just pretty much top tier outside of a few exceptions such a, that are significantly smaller if you're talking about major industrialized nations and the size and scale, the United States basically has a continent to itself and outside, or within that conditions, it's got most of the good land that's in that continent. The only thing it needs to do is basically annex a few areas of Canada and it would have all of it. Um, and so, yeah, most nations have something that are, you know, is this big and then some, or most other nations, or I'm sorry, the United States has a continent to itself that is, it's plaything. Uh, so without further ado, we'll, we'll definitely end off on that regard, and we'll push it up into, um, excuse me, we'll push it into the demography section here next. So uh, I apologize. Uh, uh, I will have to look at that take later. Uh, give me a second here. Uh, I do not know why that is there, but it's going to be there. Cool. All right, cool. Um so I don't know whether to share, but we'll look at it later. Anyway, next is the demography. Now, um, excuse me. Yeah, I um, I, I didn't I, I didn't get into the ethnicity on this one, but this is the United States demography. It is three hundred and thirty two million people, almost three hundred thirty three. And I actually did check the um. Okay, we'll definitely check that out later. Um, I definitely did check this out is that uh, we are about 2 million under what we were expecting back in tw or when I pulled the data from 2017. Is that the United States in 2020 was expected to be about 34 million, or 334 million, we pulled 332. Uh, one was immigration was a little bit lower, two birth rates were just a little bit lower too, but also in the regard that um, we had COVID that year and COVID actually between everything of pulling people in and more people were dying, it was a significant departure from what we were expecting. But the demographic, demographic structure has barely changed. Um, the good news is, is that at least from what the, the data has is that there has been an increase in, in births uh, more recently uh, in immigration recently so that the zero to four category is actually higher than what, it, what we've seen prior. Um, so the good news is we're not heading for demographic collapse. That's absolutely wonderful in the regards that it's not something we're going to have to completely panic. Uh, the Zoomers, in a large degree, are going to have to become the new Generation X, uh, and they'll be overshadowed by the Millennials. But they're not so small that they make the United States politically, politically and geographic, or sorry, geopolitically irrelevant. Uh, this is not Germany. This is not Italy. And of course, we'll be talking about those or those countries in those particular episodes, but. To be, to be frank, uh, long and short, is that uh, we're in a really good spot, or at least in a really decent spot. Uh, it's not what it is normal. Uh, we're not seeing a, uh, a population pyramid. We're seeing a population cheer, or excuse me, a population chimney. And the chimney structure, while being problematic in some regards, is proving to be quite successful for maintaining a large functional geopolitical state. And so at least for the next oh, I would say 50, 60 years, demographically, the United States isn't has a lot to be concerned with. Now, if that changes over the next five to 10 years and I'm still doing this, uh, which I hope I am, help, it, help me out, share the love, let people know what we're doing here, the United States is geared for at least the better part of this century and being equipped to handle uh, the, the problems that are coming out with it as far as population demography. Now, I didn't talk about this one. I don't have it on that. 
on that map. Now, I could do it if I really, really wanted to, but that is putting ethnicity into there and racial, uh, racial lines there. I don't like to talk about that too much because it's obviously a very touchy subject right now. And it's not that I don't want the conversation to be had, it's that there's a lot of inference that people make out of such claims. You've got, obviously, people that are basically white nationalists that say, Garrett Riggs replace with memes, and they freak out when they see some of this shit. Uh, and then you've got other people that, uh, you know, claim diversity as king and all this. Uh, if you guys want my opinions on that, go check out my other content on Mask Off. We've talked about it plenty. I'm not going to talk about it here. I'm going to maintain a little bit more professionalism when it comes to this. Okay, cool. When it comes to actually the demographic right breakdown, though, the general sense here is that, like, the people that are qualified as white, which is really superfluous, is about 62% of the population. Everybody else is some level of minority down of, you know, 1%, 2%. 13%, 16%, and going further from there. And you also have problems where people can multi, uh, what's what's the word here? You can multi-identify, so you can be, you. I can identify as Hispanic and white, uh, and that changes up numbers quite a bit. Um, so here's the general snap when it comes to demography. The demography is solid as far as age groups, as far as sex balance and culture. The, the problems that you're having with demography right now is that politically it's kind of making a nutshell, uh, that, excuse me, it's, it's creating a schism. And uh, we'll definitely talk about that more in the political section. But in the nutshell is that it, it's gotten to the point that for the conservative party, the Republican Party in the United States, is that they can no longer absolutely ignore uh, minorities and still be able to pull off key battleground states that they need to win the Electoral College. And if they want to maintain large political power is that they're basically in a massive rut. Um, Democrats are trying to fuel on this one, but actually, if you look at the whole that they've not been able to capitalize on, the, on this into a major degree. But yeah, I'm going to hit that in the politics section, so we'll kill that here. Um, overall, demography, one of the better ones in the, in the world. It's not perfect. It's not absolutely great. But as far as a developed, advanced nation, it's one of the best by far. It's a, it, it hasn't had a massive collapse in its demography to the point where they cannot operate and so without further ado we're going to close out on the demography and we'll move over into the economics all right cool economics is a little bit convoluted um there's a lot of things i can add to this i'm not going to try to do all that right now but this is the united states gdp you'll notice that in 2020 we went into uh, a recession and that was due to covid uh now the the data that's coming out looks like that we're largely out of it and we're back to uh, maybe about 2019 levels but we're not quite sure yet um, and we won't have that data out until next year about July so uh, yeah everything runs about a if you want the, the data from July of 2020 you gotta wait till July of 2021 to really get that good data that's all revised made sure that it's um, excuse me it's all revised taken care of worked out well that kind of thing and so without further ado this is the United States. The United States. The NGDP is what is the nominal. That is what is reported every single year. The RGDP is the that adjusted for inflation. So you can tell, like, hey, we were doing. This is what the actual numbers were. But if you put it in a day's dollars, this is where this is where it actually would have been at. So the United States has had a very long and consistent growth pattern, even with inflation adjusted, is that the United States is doing relatively pretty well, economically speaking. It's not one of these nations that just piles up, piles up, piles up, and then sees a massive collapse, or possibly massive collapse. I'm looking at you, China. Uh, but it is a nation that has relatively kept a general trend line that, while having its you know normal business cycles where it grows, it pops, it consolidates, what have you, is that it's largely been able to maintain, at least on a on a macro level, a very strong and vibrant economy that is growing, that is working pretty well. Uh, what I have not been able to talk about, um, and uh, we'll get into this a little bit here, is um, this is per capita. Now, the per capita is a little bit slower because the economic growth is not largely keeping pace with the population growth is that for we're adding more people than we are growth in some regards not to say that uh we're not growing at all we absolutely are but it's it's slowed down in uh particularly since the 90s and that we're seeing a significant or a uh, significant slowdown in the um growth or the economic growth per person here in the united states and that is largely because one we're kind of capped out uh a, a, a superpower nation that has a 
uh, average income of almost $65,000 per person is something that most other nations cannot even dare to compare it to. Even among the industrialized Western nations, they do not have this level of income per capita. What is important here is how the wealth distribution and all that falls into. Now, I'm not going full leftist here. Don't worry, guys. Uh, what I'm trying to say is this, is that while we do have one of the most vibrant and active geopolitical economies in the world, is that the problem is, is that it does have significant problems in the internal part that is leading to major political consequences and uh, major, geo major, major political, economic, geopolitical consequences across the board. And we're seeing that within pretty much every system that you have. And, I mean, if you just turn on the news, you've probably heard something revolving this. Uh, one of the reasons that our population growth has slowed is because of this. So what's the issue here? Well, the issue here is that the middle class in the United States, and I, I had some de graphics on this, but I don't want to do that for every, ep excuse me, I'm not going to do this for every single nation, but uh, just the United States episode is going to be longer because we know the most about the United States and, you know, we live here. Um, but just talking about the economy in the United States is that it's had its middle class largely hollowed out to where there's a, a large proponents that either you are very upper class, you're part of the capitalistic class, or you're part of the highly skilled uh, class that is basically techn technocratic. So you're either a doctor, a lawyer, or some kind of like high-end manager that makes over 100k a year, or more likely you're somebody that is very, very working class that is struggling to get by. There's very few people that are in that comfortable zone that is able to get by, but it doesn't technically qualify as like very high skilled labor or, you know, part of the uh, more technocratic, aristocratic or capitalistic class. And I'm not saying this. I know I'm using like more left wing vernacular when it comes to this. I don't have a problem with this. I just want to make that clear. What I'm getting at is that the political ramifications overall are very, uh, very, very bad. And that we, we're seeing the rise of both left-wing and right-wing reactionaries in the regards that they don't feel that the system is now working for them. They are seeing that their parents had a better lifestyle than they did, and that's causing a massive problem throughout the system. And it probably is in need of an overhaul, but we'll talk about that in the politics uh, section here shortly. But overall, the American economy still doing pretty good, still looking healthy. But it does have some major internal problems with it that is largely both political and economic and social in nature. Uh, so I'll move into the politics and I'll wrap this all together. So what we're seeing here is that the United States has a massive political problem, and that is twofold. One, we're in the point now to where, um, and I forgot to bring up this file. Crap, I am terrible. I am absolutely terrible. I apologize. Uh, I'll bring this up here in just a second. But the United States, writ large, has had this problem to where it's one in a or in a political reorganization and this happens every 20 30 40 years depending on what's going on uh, and we've seen some of you who are old enough have definitely seen this in your lives whether you remember uh, LBJ as a major changeover uh, to where the southern states largely left the Democratic Party and the Dixiecrats uh, formally came to an end uh, you may remember the Reagan revolution that was uh, largely um, excuse me, you may remember the Reagan revolution that was largely um, a conservative revolution that came to dominate politics all the way up until 1992. And even with that, the Americans largely have taken up, uh, excuse me, yeah, the Americans or the Democratic Party has largely taken up uh, some very strong corporate interests in the, under the guise of what the Republicans were able to pull off. Uh, and so I'm going to bring this up uh, right now for you guys um, is some of these older files and I don't have them sized right and I apologize for that. That uh, was me not being qu or properly prepared, but I don't have the slides available uh, for any other nation because I am not um, as in, in entrenched. All right. So I, I largely consider the six party system to largely start with LBJ in 64 with the, the, the Dixie cracks, Dixie Kratz largely leaving the democratic party. And I largely feel that it ends in 2015 with the rise of Donald Trump and a completely renovated idea of what it's supposed to be, or the Republican and democratic parties are supposed to be. And you can see these changes happen over time, but the big change definitely really starts with the Democrats uh, in 64, at least for me personally. A lot of people don't think it starts until 1980. I strongly disagree with that. But 
the the traditional coalition of the Democrats, you may notice, is not what it used to be. The Republicans also in the same regard that neither party can actually work in the regards of what they did. And so this is my current forecast that we're heading to right now. Uh, you'll notice that some of this is a little weird for some of you guys. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit yeah, as far as where we're at. Uh, but that this is just for you guys to take a look at it, where I think we're heading and what, what have you. Okay. So, again, United States episode is going to be a lot longer because I can't I can get into these nitty-gritty details of what's going on. I will be able to do a few other nations to this degree, but not a lot. A lot of it will just be able to talk about who's in charge, what's going on uh, in the political structure, and not necessarily the overall reformations that they're going through because that's very very poignant data that quite honestly I just haven't had time to get into alright so let's talk about what's happened to the Democrats the Democrats used to be the party of minorities and also the party of like the working class people and this is why you had people that were union workers and all these other uh, all these other folks that were largely coalesced into that one party it was the poor man's party it was the the, the little man's party um, and it was very akin to what we see in other countries with like labor parties and uh, all this other stuff uh, very much follow through with that but that's not really the case anymore in fact if you uh, looking at most of the voter data that we've seen in the more recently unions are leaving writ large unions have left or are leaving the democratic party and they're favoring republicans uh what we're seeing with these particular voters is that while they are concerned uh with more economically liberal takes is that most of the time they're socially conservative or most of the ones that still survive are socially conservative um and are basically right-wing uh, workers, uh, working-class people. And so they've picked up into the to, more into the Republican coalition. We'll talk about that here in a moment. What the um, Democrats are actually picking up are people that they used to actually vehemently hate and despise, and now they're having an identity crisis over that because the business community... Uh, yeah, teachers, the only people, teachers are one of the few people that haven't jumped over yet, but that's because the Republicans are doing everything they can to keep them out. Uh, that, that's a conversation for later. All right. So the, the Democrats in the, the, the area that there are right now is that they're actually getting people in their party that they used to hate and their policies are largely geared for fucking over. And that is largely wealthy business owners and middle class, uh, middle class workers that are college educated that are doing very well. And it's really weird because college educated has been part of their coalition for a while, but actually having wealthy voters in the coalition has not much been a thing. Usually those were Republican voters uh, and, and business owners wouldn't hardly ever be there. But now they're actually looking at the Democrats as the better party because one, uh, the, the Democrats didn't really do much to reinvent the workers coalition back in the nineties after they were systematically slaughtered by the Republicans back in the eighties. And you see a ever-increasing corporate bend of the Democratic Party that is now, um, excuse me, that is now getting to the point where um, the business cadre that used to be the firm establishment of the Republican Party has largely left and is now looking at the Biden administration as largely, uh, largely solid. That is uh, kind of welcoming home. And if you look at where this coalition is, while you have socialists and big business now in the same party, that's probably not going to last. And you can definitely tell, at least with the Biden administration, who he cared for and who uh, who the Democratic, um, if you will, the Democratic leads, the, Democratic, the people who run the Democratic Party actively care about. They care about the money, they care about the big influence, uh, and they're largely abandoning the people that would call be leftist, socialist, what have you. They're largely abandoning them to the political winds. And so the Democratic Party is absolutely changing in a fundamental level, and that is probably going to continue. Uh, do, I do not expect a Democratic Party that, looking forward, is going to be um, like what we saw. It's probably going to look a lot more libertarian, and that you will have a um, you'll have a blending of social liberalism and economic conservatism to where if there is some kind of social activism done, it won't be on the behalf of the government going forward. Uh, near as much as what it was from the former Democratic Party. It'll actually be jobs programs, working with corporate America so that if there is a, an, a massive money drop, it won't actually be um, corporate Democrats or it won't be Democrats spending a bunch of money through the means of the government. It'll be getting together with their corporate friends to do uh, fundraisers and whatnot for particular events that drive. And so if they're looking to get school funding for this particular area or what have you, 
I don't actually expect that the Democrats are going to continue funneling this kind of thing very long. Is that um, what we're very likely to do? Um, what is that you're going to see a far more hands-off Democratic Party to that it preaches a lot, and when it actually comes to the actions, it will be done by the corporate community. And we've also seen that within boardrooms. You've seen this within advertisements. Uh, a lot of people here on the right call that going woke. The reasons that you see BLM advertisements and all these other things is that whether they care or not, the boardrooms of America have gotten exceptionally more socially conscious and socially liberal, and that's probably going to dominate the, politi or the political atmosphere in the Democratic Party going forward. Let's look at the Republicans, because they have the exact opposite thing going on. They used to be the party of the rich people and the, and the evangelicals, and they basically shit on anybody in the coalition as long as big money got the win. That's not the case anymore. They've actively become the anti-intellectual, anti-money party to a large degree, and a lot of the people that used to be very comfortable in that party have just yeeted themselves out. The, the, the good thing and the bad thing here, and I'll let you decide where it is, is that a lot of the expertise and a lot of the knowledge base of the Republican Party is actually left. Most of the administrators that were part of the business cadre are no longer making up the political uh, establishment within the Republican Party. And so you've got a lot of people that have got a lot of fire and a lot of vigor that don't really know what they're doing. And so that's actually going to be a massive problem for the Republican Party because all the intellectuals, both the administrative class of the corporate America and the academia, are now in the Democratic Party. And not having people that can actually run them or run the establishment is going to be a massive problem for the Republicans and they're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. The other side of that conversation is, is that they've actually radically increased in their voter share. Um, I, I didn't say Democrats were becoming nationalists. I, I do not expect that at all. Uh, Republicans uh, have picked up a crap ton of voters somewhere on the border between 10 and 10 to 20 million voters and appealing to uh, actually nationalism uh, as, a, as an off board. But um, appealing to more socially conservative but economically liberal policies. And, you know, we can get into the deals at where you can. It's not right-wing economic policy in the regards that, hey, you know, give me a tax cut and call it a day. It's actually being a lot more, not directly hands-on, but a lot more um, getting involved. And an example of this is tariffs as a massive regard. The American right-wing working-class population that is now the majority of the American right-wing believes that they got screwed over by the elites, and they, got, they believe they got screwed over by corporate America in the regards that they don't want all these handouts. They're still absolutely uh, uh, upset with things like uh, food stamps uh, and the whole nine yards, even though they're actually the ones that use it most. Don't tell them that. Um, but what it really is is that they don't want people to be involved with that. They want... They want changes to the degree that they feel like the system was rigged against them, and they want to rig the system against the people who screwed them over. And so they feel like corporate America abandoned them, they, uh, they outsourced all their jobs, they outsourced all this and that, so that the average American got left with nothing. Their policy isn't to just say, hey, give me this worker program, or give me this particular program, or this. Their whole thing is re-rig the system in favor of us so that you have something like tariffs that some company who has now outsourced everything to China now has to pay more money for doing business in China to sell goods in the United States. That's their whole thing is that it's changing and I'm not saying it's going to be the definitive end, but at least for the moment what the, the American populist right wing that has largely come to dominate the Republican Party wants to do is that they want to completely reinvent the social welfare system on, on top of the fact that they want to give basically corporate America the middle finger um, and they want to go all right cool we want American jobs we want American prosperity and security but we're going to screw you over because you screwed us over in the regards that you can't do business elsewhere first you do a business in America first Anything that we can do to make sure that a job is made in America first, whether it is, um, you know, it, whether it's the janitor job, manufacturing, services, is that it has to work here first. And they've done largely, they've been, they've done largely successful in pushing some of this this narrative exceptionally. Um, the policy is really controversial because that's one of the big conversations in, t in economics right now. Uh, is how much success that they've actually had. And uh, we'll never know for sure because COVID rapidly supercharged everything that they wanted. Uh, and so we don't know how much the tariffs were actually doing what they wanted. But now that COVID is here, 
is that the right-wing populists are actually getting almost everything that they want. Outside of having a Mexico largely in tandem with the United States economic uh, and political system, uh, largely operating at the hip, is that everybody else is now largely being disconnected and exercised for excised, excuse me, from the American economic doctrine and entity. Um, Japan's holding on by a thread, but what we've definitely seen to some degree is that a lot of the things that you that were, were lied on in East Asia are lar are largely being reintroduced into the American uh, economic network. That is not over yet. And if you look at the trade imbalance, it's actually in some regards worse. What is happening right now is that there's actually been a collapse in the American export system to where most of the things that the Americans were exporting before COVID is just gone. And so the trade imbalance got worse. But if you're looking at the imbalance of what the Americans are importing, at last I checked, it's actually going down. And so bigger de trade deficit but actually trade imports are going down and we're probably going to see that continue for at least the next 18 months because most of the things that the americans are not right now worried about in dealing with covid and dealing with trade lines and also with the more economically populist both left and right is that it looks to be the case that the american economic system is now trying to br bring every job that they possibly can on board or on board into North America and particularly the United States because you don't have to deal with customs, you don't have to deal with uh, different policies regarding COVID enforcement, and so that's a boon for the American uh, system uh, domestically. What will remain to be the scene is the, dif or the difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party going forward and how they want to handle this. I expect the Democrats are largely going to start walking away from that as COVID becomes less of a thing, and that's a big issue because we have the Delta variant now, and supposedly there's a Gamma variant out now. But at least in the nutshell, at where we are, is that at least for where the United States is right now, the Democrats may become a lot more global reaching here in five years when they get a chance to, when they don't have to deal with COVID as much, and they can pick and choose who they internationally want to deal with. The, the Republicans look like whenever they get back in power, whether that's sooner or later, is that they're largely going to push a hyper-nationalist agenda that means Amer that is America first. Uh, that is, the United States will look to making any and every job operational for the average American to not only to push up the, the, the cost of labor to, to get the American working class back on its feet, but also in the regards that they don't want to have to deal with foreign entanglements as much and they're becoming incredibly isolationist while also being hardline militarists. It's kind of weird. Um, I'm not going to get... I'm not, I don't want to drop the F word on this one. And no, it's not a slur. It's just, you know, that... There's a lot of pa parallels with that particular word that I'm starting to see from the Republican Party. And if somebody doesn't steer it in a more direction that is if you will, a little bit more tame and a little bit more thoughtful in how all of these things fall out is that you can see a Republican Party that becomes very vitriolic and very or very uh, bellicose very quickly. Uh, and that is something that, it, that I'm very concerned about going forward. Um, of course, a lot of people know that I, I do favor more of the right wing here in the United States, and I do favor the Republican Party a little bit more, but I'm very upset with where everything is, both from the Democrats and the Republicans. Yeah, I don't really have my shoe in either horse at this point. Um, but anyway, just trying to get my bias there for anyone who knows. Uh, okay, so without further ado, uh, we'll close out with the politics as being this. Right now, currently, um, in the United States, the, the country is largely run by the Democratic Party on the federal level. I'm not going to get in the states. Uh, but on the federal level, the presidency is a Democrat. The House is a Democrat by about, mm, what is it, about 10 seats or so. And then it's a dead even tie within the Senate. But of course, with the vice president being a Democrat, technically the Democrats have the, the, the go in the Senate. And so it is a very light majority in regards that all three branches, no, I'm sorry, uh, all three legislative bodies in the United States as far as the creation of the legislation and the enforcement of the legislation uh, through the executive branch is currently under the Democratic um, coalition. And for anyone who is a foreign national who is watching this, uh, that I'll be talking about more in other episodes as far as how, how these coalitions work. If you, are, if you don't know, Democrats right now are a center-left coalition of people that largely put together uh, a bit of social liberalism and a bit of uh, economic liberalism together to make, bring a package to their voters 
and saying that uh, we're here to help you uh, by moving the, the needle forward in the regards of we're going to make you more free socially and we're going to try to help ease your economic concerns uh, with some very hands-on social programs that uh, largely put money in your pocket and try to make things or try to keep you going forward. The, the right-wing coalition, which is the Republican Party, is a little weird because it's morphing very, very quickly, and we're not sure where it's going to be. It used to be a center-right coalition that was largely geared around big business and basically the idea that if you were... We would give economic investment and economic opportunity to the more high-end wealthy class, and that would trickle down into other areas of the government or I'm sorry other areas of sector and so that when you had a big factory roll in you would get jobs in that factory and you'd be able to economically develop uh, the problem is, is that a lot of the right wing voter class has actively rejected this at writ large because they did not see a lot of economic evitation from the 90s and the 2000s and are actively very upset with that coalition now and they've openly inverted it so now what we have is a uh, I'm not going to say it's center right anymore, but it's definitely more of a hard right coalition that is actually stupidly popular within the Western world. It's probably the biggest farther right coalitions that you see in the developed world to where they are now actively advocating that the elites suck and the United States needs to come first when it comes to dealing with geopolitical matters. Um, I talked about that a lot, so we'll see where that goes, but uh, the, this coalition is basically reforming. Uh, and the Democratic one largely is too, and I've largely dealt with that. We'll see that uh, in a parallel with many other countries as we go on in, is that a lot of people and a lot of nations are going through their diplomatic political realignment right now because they're all kind of having the same problems, uh, just in different regards and different degrees. I can't wait to talk about Germany. Holy crap. Okay, so to end off on the political part, Democrats largely in control. It is their race to lose at this point. They're, they will have uh, major elections in 2022. That is uh, about a year from now, or I'm sorry, just over a year from now uh, for the United States House and for about one third of the seats in the Senate to figure out who if they're going to be able to maintain. Largely with them being in power, it is their race to lose. And if they are not able to sell that the American people that they can govern, they will probably lose. And you will have a split government that is fractured as much as it has been uh, in the last years that we have seen that. And so without further ado, we're going to close on the politics section and we'll get into the military section. This one's pretty easy, pretty simple. I can expand upon this depending on how much you guys want. Chat, you've been very quiet and I know we've got plenty of viewers that are at least listening in the background or watching. So without further ado, ask questions if you want to. The United States military presence is by far the best in the world. Now, it may not have the largest standing army in the world, and it may not have the most machinery overall, but what it does have, what it does have is two things. Number one is global reach, and where it can literally reach out and touch anyone that it wants to within the period of about 72 hours tops. If, that, if they want to deploy a battalion of Marines or they want to bomb the living crap out of you or tomahawk the living crap out of you, they can largely do it, and they can do it in three days. So... In a general sense, is that that's something that no one can rival. That it's absolutely nothing. Um, thoughts on NAFTA? I will get to that. That's a good question. Um, excuse me. Uh, militarily speaking, is that, on a snapshot view, is that the United States can reach out and touch conventionally and with, if they ever wanted to, WMDs. It, with a moment, with not necessarily a moment's notice, but within a week, and that's incredible. No one else can do that, even on on any kind of parity. Um, what the Americans do have going for it is is that while its land forces are actually some of the now some of the smaller ones that you can see in the world, it uh, is that it's a highly trained, highly experienced, technically. Um, ooh, great question! I can't wait to talk about that one. Um, it is that the land forces are highly trained, highly expertise, highly experienced group of people from the bottom of the office from the bottom of the enlisted all the way to the top of the officer corps most people have at least some level of combat experience they know what they're doing they're very well equipped and so they're small but they're very small adaptive mobile and able to kick a lot of ass and so with that strike package they're able to roll in with a battalion of tanks um and, or, uh, basically it's basically uh, we don't even we have combined arms battalions now where we just basically have a Attachment of tanks here, attachment of mechanized forces here. You roll in with a battalion, and you just basically roll over everybody that's in the way. Uh, the United States is basically small, nimble, mobile, ready to kick ass when it comes to its uh, land forces. 
Um, and so where, uh, where they're at on the ground is that they are very proficient, but they just don't have a, a volume of scale. But they counter that with their general doctrine in the air and on sea. In the air, they have the largest air force in the world, last I checked, um, that they have more planes serviceable, ready to go to just literally instigate combat missions and air superiority at the moment. And so what the United States plan is, both navally and, air, and, uh, navally and air-wise, is that they sanitize the sea, they sanitize the sky because they have the most proficient air force and navy is on the planet and they're bigger than everybody else's to where they can sanitize the area and they can come in and they can finally swoop in with their ground forces to finish up the job. Um, we can talk about cyber and uh, space here in a moment. But anyway, to finish out the Air Force, or their Air Force is very, very strong, very capable, very huge. They're the, they have the largest tanker fleet in the world. They're one of the few nations that actually operates AWACSs uh, and to a large degree, which are basically airborne uh, warning and control centers that uh, you basically just sit about 100 miles back behind the front line and uh, you just watch everything that's going on. Um, and so that's a really weird question. Uh, we'll get to some of these later. Just don't overly pile and we'll get there. Um, the United States, Air Force-wise, is just the creme de la creme. Now, they do have some issues. I'm not going to lie about that. Uh, where a lot of their replacement... Uh, actually, I need to talk about that for the whole fucking... For the whole thing, actually. Um, they do have some problems, but the Air Force is largely very, very experienced, very capable. They know exactly what they're doing. They have the tools and equipment to do so with very little co competition anyway. Uh, and if they do run into the worst of its competition, they can largely sanitize the area within a few hours. Um, and that's how proficient they are. The Navy, not necessarily in the same state, but largely. Um, the United States Navy has been shrunk by a significant measure. It used to be a 600-boat Navy back in the late 80s. It is now less than 300. Um, that was kind of coming. But in the general sense is that, at least with the Navy, the Navy is the most practiced, proficient as well, uh, along with everybody else. Uh, they're just... The United States Navy is supreme. They have about 11 super carriers right now, which are no one has anything to level against. The closest thing that comes to that is the two Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers that are about one half, two thirds the size, and they they still don't carry remotely the same aircraft complement. Uh, but the long and the short here is that the Queen Elizabeth are the only major rival for the American aircraft carrier fleet and their allies. Uh, they also have 10 sub-carriers that are basically amphibious assault carriers that either can carry VTOL aircraft, helicopters, or me basically a marine detachment. Um, and basically they get together with a few other ships and they can um, they can basically go out and invade. All right, so I'm going to answer a few questions here and then I want to talk about this overall. What about our heavy bomber fleet? B-2 is over 30 years old, um, less than 40 uh, B-52s left, even fewer B-1B bombers. Um, if we lose two, lose five, two, okay, well, I, that's weird. If we lose a few B-52s, it'll be impossible place. Okay, so here's the thing. I'm going to talk about this in a nutshell overall for the United States military. The United States military has a lot of equipment, but a lot of it is old. And that is everything from the F-15 and the F-16 and the United States Air Force to the M-1 Abrams on, on the ground, um, uh, the M1 Abrams and the M2 Bradley that is on, or in the Army and in the Navy is that most of its fleet is pretty old with, um, excuse me, with uh, Ticonderoga and Arleigh Burke class destroyers. Um, some of this is changing, and of course the United States Navy is the one that's getting ahead of all the other branches and getting Gen 5 weaponry off the ground in, in numbers. And the reason why is that the United States, everyone knows, the Congress, everyone who is basically in, within the DOD knows that if you want somebody to do their job right, the Navy has to come first because they are the ones that will defend the United States in the event of an attack or dealing with foreign entities. And so the Navy always comes first, and that's always been the case, uh, all the way since World War I. All right, so let's put this in a nutshell. The United States Navy is the, in the lead at getting newer equipment on board. And just to put you out, we've had the, of the Generation 5 weaponry that they're calling these things uh, that we have, we have the, um, we have the Virginia class submarine. It's very proficient. I'm not going to say it's the best thing ever. Uh, the Seawolf 
largely was part of, was part of that program, but the Virginia is basically a souped up I six eighty eight, um, or what we call a Los Angeles class. It works. It's good. It's solid. It does its mission very well. And there's over twenty of them now. So Virginia Virginia class doing very well. Uh, the Zumwalt was a disaster and a disgrace, and they've actually souped up the Arguly Burke and the Flight 4 and Flight 5 refits so that their military hardware is still very capable, but it's not to the same cutting edge uh, that you would expect out of Gen 5 platform. Basically, the Arguly Burke is a Gen 4 Plus, or actually a Gen 3 Plus in some regards. It's got a lot of the modern um, weapons control and fire control programs on it, but it doesn't have some of the more advanced stuff that we're expecting out of Gen 5 weaponry, such as hypersonic missiles, uh, potential point defense lasers, that kind of thing. Um, I don't think that's actually going to happen, by the way. But at least where we're at is that uh, a lot of these weapon systems that we have are still largely old, and what we have been replacing is finally coming on board now. Some of them a little bit older, some of them a little bit newer. Uh, the first... Uh, American replacement carrier the Ford class is now in service and the second one I believe just got launched and is on sea trials and will be ready for commissioning within the next year. Um, so the United States carrier forces are still doing well the amphibious assault ships are consistently getting renovated and fixed up uh, so that the United States Navy is in a largely functional place but at least as far as its maxed out capabilities and what it could do, it's had some funding cuts, it's had some redesign issues to where some of these things aren't to where they need to be. Um, there's a big conversation on the Virginia that it actually doesn't have the same capabilities of the Sea Wolf, and that is true. Um, I'm not going to get into the details because some of those are classified, but suffice it to say is this. Um, the Sea Wolf absolutely was faster and it could go deeper. Uh, whether that's a concern or not, that's kind of up to the DOD. And the DOD has largely decided that that's not necessarily a concern. Uh, what we've definitely seen is the Zoom Alt was an absolute disaster. It did teach us a lot of things. Um, excuse me. Um, the Zoom Alt has taught a lot of things about what can be done with new weapon systems going forward. But for to be the replacement for the Arleigh Burke class destroyers, that is absolutely not the case. They've actually rebuilt the Arleigh Burke program with Flight third Fight four and five so that uh, that's going to be the mainstay of the fleet going forward uh, the Ticonderogas do not have a replacement because it was supposed to be a super zoom walt or the zoom walt was supposed to replace both uh, and that got to screwed or that got screwed is it true the department of defense used to be called the department of war yes and it needs to go back to that because that's just some pc bullshit all right um uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. J just to re bring this all together, um, the, United, the United States Air Force did try to put new modern equipment into the field at about the same time the Navy was, and you can see that with the F-22 Raptor. It did have a limited build program, but it was canceled under the Obama administration, and it's never been re, um, it's never been reinstituted. Uh, and so at least uh, in a general level here is what we're talking with is that, um, the United States Air Force has actually reinvigorated the F-15 program under the EX program because it is cheaper, more efficient, and there's nothing really that can really challenge the F-15 so far uh, that is actually in service, built in numbers that the Americans are really worried about as far as the Air Force. And so, crazy as it is, the replacement for the F-15, the F-22 Raptor, is slated to be retired come 2030, and the EX program will actually take its place in replacing it. So... There is a sixth-generation fighter program that's actually been booted up, but it probably won't be on board until the late 30s, or until the 2030s. Um, so, at least where we are right now, the United States military, very strong, very capable, but a lot of its pro-weapon systems are old, antiquated, and actually past its sell-by date. We can get into the early Arleigh Burks. We can get into the, the few Los Angeles class that we still have left, but those are largely gone. Um... The A-10 is a shining example. The F-16 is a good example. The F-15 is a good example of this. The M-1 Abrams is an amazing example of this. All this stuff is old as hell. And even with the new modern variants that have come out, is that they are now... They have two problems. One, some of the original production plants for these things were shut down, and they had to be rebooted, which is expensive as hell. But more importantly is that with more modern systems coming online, is that these are actually typed out to what their design profile was supposed to be. And what that means is this. The M1 Abrams has been upgraded. 
It was originally about a 60 to 65 ton tank, and it's been upgraded with a bigger gun, more armor, um, a little bit of a better power plant as the time comes along, but it's actually maxed out in what you can largely do with it, uh, because either the thing is now going to be a 75 ton tank moving down the line, or um, what is largely getting to the point now is that uh, you just what we expect out of a modern vehicle is that um, uh, excuse me what is largely powered by the modern vehicle is that it, it doesn't serve the purpose that we're expecting further ahead is that we want lighter vehicles with actually less armor that have standoff munitions on them that will intercept a missile or what have you but the whole point is that we're kind of going back to what we saw in Gen 2 and Gen 3 which is screw armor screw protection just have enough for the small arms and for rocket propelled grenades and then have enough that you can access the target shoot it first kill it first and basically win the battle that way offensively instead of defensively and that looks like that's where we're heading going forward into the modern era uh with ground forces all right i've talked a lot about all these different things so i'm answering questions militarily um yeah the burke is over 30 years old um Ships and boats are expensive. Time to build, to build yes. Um, is China catching up militarily? In some regards, yes. Uh, there's a lot of questions about their technical proficiency as far as, like, do their weapons actually work? Because they haven't really even tested them to a large degree. And, I mean, it's one thing where you test them on the firing line. It's another thing where you test them in active military combat. And uh, the United or China hasn't engaged in a military conflict since Vietnam. So, in a sense here, we have no idea... Uh, we have no idea how good their weapons are. Theoretically, they could be enough to sub-rival the American uh, weapons or to rival everything that is Gen 4. Uh, that's on the table, but uh, we do know from some of their technical doctrines and, or sorry, some of their technical receipts and through espionage that some of their stuff just isn't up to snuff. Uh, their missiles aren't nearly as accurate as what we have been able to see. Uh, their jet engines still fucking suck after all this time. Um, they're getting better at stuff, but in a general sense is that their, their submarines are still noisy. They're better now, but they're still pretty goddamn noisy. Their, their jets don't operate as efficiently as American ones, which, granted, the East always did make theirs where they were heavier planes and they were heavier engines. So, take that what you will. Um, what we do need to get into, and I forgot to tackle this, I'll finish up the questions here in a second. Uh, I did not talk about cyber and I did not talk about space. The United States absolutely dominates space. We have more satellites, more inlet, more everything up in the orbit than anybody else can, everybody else combined. We dominate space, and we also dominate anti-space weapons if we ever decide to use them. There are anti-satellite missiles. There are things that we can do to shoot people's crap out of the sky if we want to. So far, that is absolutely verboten. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, but everyone's kind of knowing that if a major geopolitical conflict... Um, uh, develops is that n knocking out everybody's space communications is a number one priority. Um, cyber. Cyber is the big question on everybody's mind right now because no one knows anybody's capabilities. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians obviously have been showing off that they do have cyber capabilities and they've been basically letting their uh, forces hack into civilian infrastructure and what have you uh, to figure out how it's all working. The, the, big, the big conversation is this. We have a pretty good idea of what the Russians and the Chinese are capable of, and it's a little scary at some times, and they may be in the lead. What we don't know is that the United States has played this largely hands-off to where they've, they've had a very strict rules of engagement because they, the United States has openly said that engaging with uh, civilian infrastructure and uh, political infrastructure is basically an act of war. They don't want it to happen to them, and they don't want, anyone to, they don't want to do it to anybody else. There's been a few exceptions of this, such as the virus that was made from the intelligence services to destroy the Iranian refi ref excuse me, processing facility. We saw that back in the 2000s under the Bush administration to where we, we made a virus. We, we blew up, um, we largely used it to blow up a centrifuge place in Iran. Um, long story short, we don't know what the American capabilities are offensively and defensively when it comes to cyber. We could be wholly outgunned or we could absolutely be literally have the kill button on everybody and no one knows it yet. That is a very interesting conversation to have, and it's just really theoretical, and unfortunately, and fortunately, we won't know unless the big, the big buttons get hit. Um, so, holy crap, y'all are getting very active, uh, but the military chat always seems to uh, get a lot of uh, conversation. So, to wrap this up, 
um, is that uh, how, how much does the U.S. overpay for its equipment? Not terribly by much. Um, you know, there's a long conversation with how much the DOD spends, but if you want to be a major world power, you have to do two things. One, you have to actually have the equipment. That's a lot of money. And two, you actually have to have good equipment. And that means you're paying a lot in R&D. Um, the problem that the United States has been having is that we keep having these weapons programs to where we have a bidding war for it. And so, one, the government actuaries are like, oh, well, this, pr you know, we, they, they don't know, or they're stupid, where this program is going to cost $2 billion. They think it's going to cost $1 billion, and so the actuaries fuck it up. And then what you have is a bidding war to where you openly go, hey, look, we want you to bid on this program so that you can update this thing or build this new thing. And obviously, because of the bids, we always almost, we sometimes go with the lowest bidder or somebody that seems most reasonable. And then we go with that. And of course, it's always lower than what it's going to be. And so the United States procurement system just basically needs an overhaul. We, we basically, instead of doing bidding work, we need to do contract work. We, we know how much this is going to cost. We know how much this is going to run. Just put the final bill on the tab right then and there instead of doing 60 to 70% of the work and then having to get an extension on how much we, we're actually um, firing off regarding uh, government expenditures and we can just have it formally introduced there and then. Uh, Colonel Dan, thanks for the follow. And Colonel Dan is a, a very interesting streamer. I will uh, give him a shout out, but definitely go look at what he is doing. He is a retired colonel. Um, uh, I want to make sure I've got the right person here, but uh, he is a retired colonel uh, of 32 years in the U.S. Army, uh, if I've got the right person. So anyway, uh, let me finish up wrapping up the, some of these questions. Uh, are tanks new powered by nuclear? No. Uh, no aircraft or no tanks are, prepared, are powered by nuclear. Uh, they've tried to do a little bit of that here and there, way, way back in the 60s. It's too heavy. It's too. It's just not worth it. Um, so at least on a general level, uh, only naval vessels are powered by nuclear and they're compact nuclear reactors. Um, why doesn't the government publicize every single transaction for people to see? Uh, national security is the big reason. Um, it, uh, Wheeler's log. Uh, yeah, um, it is your tax dollars, but there is you, you don't want people knowing how much money you're spending on this particular research program or this particular research program, and so a lot of this is actually um, a lot of this is classified by the Armed Services Committee to where they have a black budget. Every now and again, we'll find out how much the black budget is, and they'll actually say, "Hey, this is how much is going into DARPA and black programs." But they won't subdivide it into that, and they're very they're very hesitant on even firing off the main number. Um, so largely, a lot of it's just kind of out there. Um, and so uh, yeah, uh, let me keep going down. Uh, how good is our intel? Can our intel be of China? Um, couldn't they be hiding tons of stuff, and we might not have a good gauge on their own? Um, so there's a co big conversation there that gets into intelligence. Um, can you hide stuff? Absolutely. But hiding stuff is actually really expensive. What's actually way better and way easier is deceiving people into thinking you have way more than you do. Because it's easy to make an inflatable or may easy to make it look like you've got a lot of fleet movements and stuff by using the same ships over and over again in, in ways that fools the satellite cameras or fools the electronic gathering, uh, information gathering to make it think that you've got way more than what you do. It's really hard to hide stuff because you have to like satellites are really really good um you have to be able to um excuse me what i need to paraphrase this in a way that doesn't sound schizophrenic and stupid it's easier to fake that you have more because you can do drills and certain things that makes it look like you have more but hiding the things you have requires incredibly advanced facilities um and even like moving things around and hiding them in places that are basically out of plain sight you can do but you don't want to do that because then they're not useful and so you can basically have a giant inventory somewhere in the in the gobi desert but you they're in the gobi desert you're not going to be able to deploy them with any kind of time and ease uh and so that's kind of the general thing is that you know where to look for stuff if they want to use the stuff and as long as you can work in that regard yeah um, okay, so I heard some countries developing sea drones, fast maneuver over remote control, can use to swarm ships as far as we know, with no point in systems for underwater. Uh, drones are a big conversation, but it's a really big conversation that goes to a thousand different conversations. Um, 
Well, basically, what is this? Drones are definitely going to play a role in the future, but no one knows for sure where one starts and one stops because drone technology is growing rapidly. We do know that it is going to be used in as auxiliary in a lot of different places, but what we don't know is uh, where this is all going to end. Holy crap, I'm an hour and 10 minutes. Holy crap. All right, so I need to wrap this up, but largely, drones, definitely of the future, but we're not sure where, where its capabilities start and end uh, to a large degree. Um, um, both. In the 2000s buildings. Uh, largely this is all military chat, and I know this always becomes popular, but I'm going to end. Uh, okay, uh, somebody, or uh, NAFTA, yeah, I'll, I'll hit NAFTA. My, my opinion on NAFTA was this. Uh, NAFTA with China, or NAFTA with Canada is absolutely pointless, um, and it was largely rectified by NAFTA 2 or the USMCA, is that most of the, um, most of the things that, uh, the exemptions that were, uh, in trade policy that Canada got in NAFTA were revoked in NAFTA too. And so largely the United States and Canada is on the same playing field as far as free trade. Uh, there is some domestic things that they have to deal with, but overall uh, USMCA was an, an absolutely good overhaul that the United States needed. Uh, dealing with Mexico is a little bit of a different story and it goes into your personal politics is that, uh, uh, excuse me, when it comes to um, Mexico is that there's a big conversation on if we want to onboard them economically and politically to where they're basically attached to the hip. Uh, there's a lot of pros and cons to that. Uh, you're going to have to deal with cheaper labor from Mexico that they're is going to be out or, or able to outcompete American labor across the board. But on the other side of that is that having a developed Mexico that looks a little bit more economically stable might have major political ramifications that makes it a more stable state and something we don't have to deal with falling apart. We've had to deal with that many times in the past. And so I'm not sure which where you want to side with that one. That's going to be your own. I'm going to say that the conversation with Mexico is very nuanced, and I'm not going to say whether one or the other one is absolutely good uh, or the right way to go. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, Xerxes, uh, if that's the case, we should have told the world we had like 10,000 F-22s instead of 300 or less. Uh, you can do that. Everyone knows that you're lying, but it does actually add a level of disconcernment. Uh, the problem is, is that every time you say something like that, the United States public pisses a fit because uh, they don't like the idea that their money is being spent in their own regards. And that's actually one of the few things that the democratic nations have as a weakness versus the more authoritarian uh, controlled nations is that we kind of have to be a lot more honest with what our hardware purchases are. Otherwise, the tax base gets a little pissed off. Uh, China doesn't have to deal with that because China can just be like, we have 10,000 and no one cares because they'll just be told to shut up. Uh, lastly, before you go, out of curiosity, where do you learn, um, what do you know about U.S. geopolitics? Okay, so there's a lot of information that I get. A lot of it is personal researches. If you want people that are experts in the field that know, you can go to people like Peter Zion, which is uh, the guy who kind of inspired me to do all of this stuff. Um, he's a very good geopolitical analyst in dealing with the economic and security measures regarding uh, on the ground stuff. So if you're looking at like U.S. oil production, if you're looking at uh, how they're how we're dealing with cyber, um, that kind of thing, he's pretty good for that. Not gonna say he's amazing, but he's pretty good for it. Definitely go check him out. If you're looking for more, um, if you're looking for more specializations within like the United States military and stuff, that's largely from interactions I've had with. Um, Yes, Zion. Um, that is largely done through um, my interactions with people that are experts in the field, whether that is ex-submariners, uh, ex-officers, all that kind of thing, is that I what basically I pride myself going out and talking to people that should be in the know. Every now and again, of course, you get contradictory information, and you also get stuff that people will leak and not, and will practice uh, OPSEC, where they're worried about security, but eventually, if you talk to enough people, you get the sense of what's really going on, in my opinion. And so at least where I'm at is that geopolitically, I get a lot of my uh, information from my own personal research. You can find stuff on the United States Census Bureau as far as demog demography. Uh, you can check most economic data from uh, the World Bank, uh, things like that. And so moving forward and closing this out, there's plenty of people that you can look into and plenty of research that you can do. Uh, I would say PM me if you want specific information that where I got it from. 
uh, and some of it's just anecdotal with having to deal with people that are experts in the field. So, without further ado, we are at an hour and almost 15 minutes, and none of the spotlights will be remotely this long if you're still here. So when we do China, when we do Russia, all that, it will not be remotely this long in what we're dealing with. It will largely be more of a uh, uh, more of a snapshot of what's going on, and then we'll do geopolitical history and all that other stuff. Without further ado, I have been Tiberius D. The stream will not be ending. I will still be here for Q&A and a few other things. Uh, but what I am ending is, is this particular snapshot episode that will be going up on YouTube on the geopolitics section. So go check that out. Uh, so without further ado, it's been an absolute pleasure, YouTube, and having you guys here. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Comment down below. Let people know what we're doing. And uh, you can contact me and all the wonderful things there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, yeah, it's been fun. Uh, where's my outro button? There's my outro button. <laughs>